free training provided by the HVAC School Podcast is made possible because of the generous support from our sponsors, Testo, Rector Seal, and Carrier. Testo is celebrating 60 years of high quality instrumentation with their best in class fall combustion analyzer promotion. There's never been a better time to get a high quality Testo combustion analyzer than right now. This offer is for a free 770-3 meter, the meter we've talked about a lot on this podcast with Bluetooth and direct power reading and inrush amps and many more great features. You can get that meter for free if you purchase the Testo 320 or 330 series of combustion analyzers, or you can get a 745 non-contact voltage sensor if you purchase the Testo 310. This is a limited time offer, and you can find out more by going to hvacrschool.com forward slash fall promo, which will take you to the Testo site where you can get the form to fill out. You do need to hold on to your receipt from whoever you purchased the combustion analyzer from but of course we suggest if you don't have a a local supply house that stocks these you can easily go to truetechtools.com t-r-u tech tools.com and use the offer code get schooled and you'll get an additional eight percent off then just save your receipt that you get from true tech tools go to hvacrschool.com forward slash fall promo and fill out the form and you will get either a free 770-3 meter or a 745 non-contact voltage sensor from testo Testo, 60 years of excellence. Perfect for testing, perfect for service. Meet Zoomlock, the 10 second flame free refrigerant fitting from Parker. Reduce labor costs by 60% with no brazing, no flame, and no fire spotter. Discover how Zoomlock can help you be more efficient and productive. Visit zoomlock.com for more information. And now, the guy who thinks thermodynamics makes for good dinner conversation and also wonders why he has no friends, Brian Orr. Heidi, here to Hody. This is Brian with the HVAC School Podcast. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for listening. Thanks for being a listener to the HVAC School Podcast. It means a lot that you take the time to listen to this kind of stuff. Mostly means a lot for you because it means you're investing in your career and in the industry. So today on the podcast, we have Jamie Kitchen, and if you've listened to this podcast for a while, you know that Jamie's been on the podcast a couple times. He is a big shot trainer with Dan Foss in North America. Jamie's actually from Canada, so you'll hear a little bit of that Canadia in his voice. But today we talk about electronic expansion valves. We talked about TXVs in the past. We kind of first start the conversation by setting up different types of metering devices and just going through the different reasons for the different types of metering devices. But then Jamie gets specifically into electronic expansion valves, EEVs, and how they work. So here we go, Jamie Kitchen with Dan Foss talking about electronic expansion valves. Thanks for coming back on the podcast, Jamie. Absolutely. Great to be back. And so Jamie is a big shot. I think that actually is what your business cards say. I think it says big shot at Dan Foss, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, BS, man. That's what it stands for. That's what we thought. Jamie's in the training division, but he's also been dipping his toe in more of the grocery store refrigeration. We were just talking about that, which was interesting stuff. We're going to talk a little bit today about metering devices in general. We've already talked about thermostatic expansion valves, TXVs, TEVs. But today I want to talk a little bit more about electronic expansion valves. And as it turns out, that's actually something that you've been thinking a little bit more about recently, right? Yeah, there's definitely the idea in people's heads now to start migrating towards there and people have a lot of questions. So usually when I'm doing a class on metering devices or refrigeration, I almost guarantee to get a question on EEVs. It used to be, you know, variable speed. Where's variable speed going? Now there's a lot of focus on EEVs, especially in the aftermarket, because we're starting to actually see EEVs in equipment that typically would have had a TXV or even fixed orifice like a piston for that matter. So people are starting to be aware. They're starting to be concerned if you want to use that word. They don't want to be caught off guard. Be prepared as much as they possibly can so that when the opportunity arises, they're comfortable in either installing these things or servicing them or at least explaining to their customers or to others how they work. And obviously the benefit is the big part. What are the benefits I could expect by installing an EEV, electronic expansion belt? 
Got it. So before we jump into that, let's just do a quick review of metering devices. And I'll kind of start off here. There's a couple different ways that metering device purpose can be stated, but one of its jobs or its primary job, if you will, is to create a pressure drop. You have pressure in the liquid line, you have liquid high pressure refrigerant, relatively high pressure refrigerant. And the metering device, the job of the metering device is to create a pressure drop, right? Absolutely. Building on that, I think that's a concept that most people think they understand the relationship between pressure and temperature. But when it comes to practice, I've seen people stumble over the fact that the reason we drop that pressure is so that we can control the actual temperature the refrigerant boils at. And that's the absolute difference between low temp refrigerant and high temp refrigerant is what pressures are they operating at? So when you pick a meter device, you have to establish what pressure drop, what is the operating conditions that I want this system to operate at? Everything from a wine cooler that's operating with a very high evaporator temperature, say 50 degrees, through air conditioning, medium temp refrigeration, and then low temp refrigeration down to minus 10, minus 20. That's all determined essentially by the pressure drop that occurs across the metering device. And that's an interesting distinction to make because in most cases, we are transferring the heat out of the refrigerant. So we're condensing the refrigerant to outdoor ambient air. That's typically what we're using as the medium. So our condensing temperatures stay fairly consistent. There's some variability, but fairly consistently tied to the outdoor air temperature unless you start to go to some form of head pressure control. And so application to application, there's not as much variability if you're using outdoor air. Now, obviously, there's cascade systems and there's water source systems and all that. But the bulk of what we work on is transferring that heat to the outdoor air. And so that side of the system is fairly consistent across applications. But the pressure drop side of the equation is not consistent across applications because you have very low temp refrigeration or low temp refrigeration. And then you all the way up to high temperature air conditioning. You mentioned wine coolers where you have a much lower pressure drop. And so depending on the application, that metering device needs to have more or less pressure drop. Absolutely. Again, how stable that high side pressure is or temperature really has a big impact on the metering device that you can choose. And this, you know, beginning with a basic orifice fixed piston, take a wine cooler. Where's a wine cooler located? Well, it's not stuck outside generally. It's usually inside in a conditioned space, most of the time in people's basement. So what do you got? A four degree temperature gradient between high and low temperatures in your basement maybe? And you're keeping your evaporator temperature relatively constant, especially in a wine cooler, because you're not loading tons of hot product in there at any given time. That's probably the pinnacle of straight as a board, high pressure, low pressure, being stable. So with a stable pressure differential, you put a fixed orifice in there and you're going to get very close feed 24 7 when the system is operating in other words if you're getting a pound a minute today you'll get a pound a minute tomorrow or at whatever time of day it is you don't get that swing in temperature that occurs outdoors so there's a great example of where a fixed orifice is probably the best for a scenario like that because you pick a point that you want to maintain an optimal point and it will keep it that way 24 7 365 days a year there's an example where I wouldn't probably recommend going to anything more complicated than a cap tube or a piston, because to be honest with you, there would be absolutely no advantage in it. Well, even if you think about you know, the traditional refrigerator with the capillary tube metering device, you make a really good point. When you have a refrigerator, it's designed to be in a fairly fixed temperature environment. It's designed to be inside in controlled temperatures. And this is actually why, if you've ever noticed, you can take a refrigerator that you have in, inside your house and then take that same refrigerator and put it in your garage in Florida in a dirty, high temperature environment. And the thing doesn't perform as well because it wasn't designed to function in that type of an environment because you are now changing the condensing temperature beyond what it was really designed for. So when you have that condenser that's in a very fixed temperature environment and you have a box temperature that's fixed, you have your evaporator temperature that's fairly fixed in a reach-in um, residential refrigerator, refrigerator slash freezer, that's a perfect example where a cap tube makes perfect sense. You really don't need anything more than that. And it's also why we don't recommend, unless you absolutely have to, freeze product in your freezer because it's not designed to increase refrigerant flow in the increase evaporator capacity to make up for that extra load you're putting in there. So if you want to freeze something fast in order to have the best preservation, the best quality of meats and things like that, when you thaw it out, it's best to buy it pre-frozen and then place it in your freezer. Can you freeze something in your freezer? Absolutely. We do it with water all the time. But the fact is it will take a lot longer and 
and the ice crystals that form will be larger and there will be more tissue damage than if you flash froze it. That's why companies like McDonald's flash freeze their meat. Okay, I know we're talking about McDonald's here, but the fact is you flash freeze it so that when you thaw it out, it is almost identical to the consistency of the way it was before you actually froze it when it was fresh. So there's an aside to that. We are kind of bumping up against the limitations of a fixed orifice, but for 95% or whatever of the applications you want to use for it, that fridge works beautifully. You just identified the reason why within commercial refrigeration, you are using TXVs largely. And now we're moving to more and more electronic expansion valves, which we're going to get to, which is that in that particular application, even if you have a reach in, for example, something where the condenser is in the condition space. If you have variability in interior load, then you don't have any way to adjust the feeding of the evaporator coil to match that load. It's simply fixed. And so what Jamie's saying there, and and this is a really good point, is that if you take fresh, let's say you chop up a bunch of chicken and you throw it in your freezer at home, it's got to be a decent amount. Obviously, if it's just a little bit, it's probably not going to make a huge difference. But when you add that additional load from that warm product into your freezer and it has to drop that product temperature, it's going to underfeed that evaporator coil, a fixed orifice, because it can't adjust and allow more flow into the evaporator coil to help compensate for that additional heat load. When you're sizing equipment and let's say you're doing a walk-in box just to jump up a level, the rules state that if you put fresh meat in here, you have to get it down to a certain temperature within a certain period of time. So if you're going to put 100 pounds of fresh pork or beef or something in there, the rules say you've only got six hours or whatever it is to get it down to this condition in order to limit bacterial growth. If you look at your load during that six hours, it is probably going to be substantially higher, to put it modestly, than what the load was previously when the door was shut, the system had pulled down, and the only thing you're really dealing with is a little bit of infiltration and heat coming through the walls of the box. Right then and there, if you look at a TX valve and you look at the opening curve of a TX valve, I can point to exactly where you're going to be during pull down. And I can also point exactly to where you're going to be six hours later, but just before the thermostat cuts off the system. Right. And when Jamie says pull down, I always like to redefine terms if you don't know what that means. Hot pull down is a term or pull down is a term that's used to describe a condition in refrigeration where you have higher evaporator load than the system is designed for at peak operation or a normal operation. I guess the air conditioning equivalent of that would be away on vacation and you've set your thermostat for 78 or 80 degrees in the house to save energy or turn the thing off altogether. And you come back and you've got high humidity, you've got high air temperature, but more specifically, everything inside that house, all tens of thousands of pounds of your house is a lot warmer than it would be if the air conditioning was running. So when you turn that air conditioning on, not only are you cooling the air in the house, but you're also pulling the moisture and the heat out of everything that's inside of that house. So that would be your pull down period. And as we all know, that can take a long time before we finally get all those conditions back to where it would normally be if the system was running on a regular basis. And it's something that I think air conditioning technicians discount, at least in my market. You have a high humidity, high temperature market. And so we'll go fix an air conditioner and the thing's been down three days over the weekend and it had a bad compressor and we replace it and we get it functioning and it was 92 degrees in the house. And then almost every single time, I mean, no matter what we tell the customer, four hours later, six hours later, they're calling us back and saying, it's still hot in here. It's not cooling down like it used to. And what you have to realize, or what we wish the customers would realize in these circumstances, is that everything in that house has mass. And all the stuff inside that house has to also give up its heat. It's not just the air. It's not just changing the air temperature. In refrigeration, refrigeration technicians know this very well, that once you get a whole box full of product in a reach-in or in a walk-in, you've got all this product, and all this product is down to temperature. Well, that actually helps stabilize the fluctuations of the temperature in the box. So even when that system goes into defrost or whatever the case may be, all of that product in there is this gigantic heat sink. And so there's not going to be huge temperature fluctuations in those spaces. It's going to take a lot of time for temperature to change, which gives you the opportunity to do things that you need to do like defrost and evaporator coil. But if you were to put hot product in there, product that was at room temperature, that takes a load of energy to get that down to the target temperature. Yeah, because it probably weighs as much as all of the air inside of the restaurant, as opposed to inside of the walk-in box, right? If you want to look at it in that standpoint. So there's a lot of thermal mass. We have a fancy term for that. It's called thermal inertia. In other words, how resistant something is to change in temperature. So if something weighs a lot, it's got a lot of inertia, it's going to take a long time to change the temperature. 
The opposite of that is I can remember when we used to go snowmobiling as kids and you'd go into one of these cabins that you rent and you go in there and inside is pretty much ambient temperature, 35 or 25 degrees or 20 degrees Fahrenheit. So you fire up the wood stove and the baseboard heaters, the air temperature goes up to 75 degrees inside, you turn that stuff off and that temperature is going to plunge right back down to 45 degrees again because the rest of the house is still cold. Exactly. Yeah, it's really interesting when you think about these things, because these are things that people who work in refrigeration, they consider more often, and air conditioning technicians maybe don't consider as much. We think very much in terms of air temperature, and it isn't just air temperature. It is the temperature of all of that mass. But one thing that you brought up in the last podcast where we talked about TXVs that I want to point out again here is it really does come down to the pounds of refrigerant moving through that evaporator coil and the temperature at which it's boiling. Those really are the two factors that control how much heat is being removed by that evaporator coil, right? Yeah, the temperature difference between the air and the refrigerant, all else being the same, and the mass flow through the other refrigerant through the evaporators. And if you take a coil design and you run refrigerant through it and you run more refrigerant at a higher delta T, a lower temperature difference, you're going to have an issue boiling off of that refrigerant without increasing airflow, for example. Vice versa, you lower the amount of refrigerant through the evaporator. You increase the delta T across there. Now you got to reduce your airflow. So everything is in a balance there right now. The system itself, specifically with a TXV or an adaptive control, will always find a balance. And we see that like we discussed last time. As soon as your load starts to fall off, the TXV throttle is closed. This drops the pressure in the evaporator because the compressor is still pumping all that refrigerant out of there until it finds its balance. So the system will always find a balance between how much refrigerant is going through, the evaporator pressure, and system capacity. So everything is going to find a balance depending on what we do. And we can easily do this. you got these refrigeration trainers in schools and training classes. Throw a piece of paper up against the evaporator coil and cut back your airflow 50% or 40% and watch what happens. If you have a cap tube, the first thing you're going to notice is your superheat goes in the toilet and you start getting liquid out of your evaporator. Your pressure may drop a little bit. Whereas with a TXV, your superheat might drop a couple of degrees, but your evaporator pressure is going to drop substantially. In fact, if you're running at, say, 40 or 45 degrees in the classroom and you cut your airflow, you're probably going to drop below freezing and start to ice up. The TX valve is doing exactly what it's designed to do. It's not a TXV problem. Another interesting thing, and this is a little bit of an aside, but it's something that I hadn't thought about as fully as I had recently. I was talking to Jim Bergman, and he was telling me that if you reduce the heat content of a a fixed orifice system, so you reduce the load on a fixed orifice system, what he was saying will happen is that your head pressure will start to drop pretty rapidly. And I was like, why would that happen? I wasn't really getting it. He's like, try it. Just do it. And so we shut off a blower on a fixed orifice system and watched what happened. And the head pressure dropped just as quick, almost proportional to how fast the suction pressure dropped. Sure, you're not rejecting as much heat, so you don't need as high a delta T between the air and the... Exactly, because you're not absorbing as much heat, you're rejecting as much heat. So when you're compressing it, that heat's not being exposed. And so therefore, you don't see the increase in pressure. It's just a really interesting effect, because generally speaking, while the superheat does drop, there's a counterbalancing effect because the head pressure is also dropping which then also affects it. So it's just a really interesting thing that I never fully considered. No, that's a good point, though, because again, everybody has to realize you got to think about a system as a whole. Get rid of this component focus. I know it's an easy thing to become fixed on a component, but if you're fixed on a component, you're missing out pretty much everything else that could be going on into that system. What are the ambient conditions? What is your load? How dirty? What is my airflow? How much airflow do I have? Is there issue somewhere else in the system that can be causing problems? A lot of times you can come for one thing, but you'll notice that there's some other definite issues with the system that if corrected would pay for themselves in energy cost savings in a very short period of time. Really, you got to be open to how the whole system is operating. You get rid of this component focus only. I think we'd be a lot better off if people were more comfortable understanding how that whole system operates, depending on the load and your ambient conditions. For those of you listening, we're like 15 minutes into this thing, and we haven't even said a th- word about electronic expansion valves, but we're setting the stage for electronic expansion valves, so be patient. 
If we have a perfect situation, especially when we have either varying ambient conditions outside, so varying conditions that are affecting their condensing temperature, and then also varying load conditions, we want to be able to still produce a proper amount of pounds of refrigerant mass flow rate through that evaporator coil to match the load on that evaporator coil. So we're fully optimizing that coil without running the potential of flooding back to the compressor. Is that the way that you think of that? Is there another way of saying that? Absolutely, man. You want to maintain a minimum superheat because superheat is removing capacity from an evaporator. It's also raising the average temperature of the evaporator. By thinking along these terms, when I say raising the average temperature, that's a temperature above saturation. So that's not helping you. That's not saying I'm raising my saturation temperature so my compression ratio is lower and I'm doing less work and saving energy. That is basically cutting into your efficiency and your net refrigeration effect, your cooling, and it's raising the average evaporator temperature. So from an air conditioning standpoint, that is the opposite of what we generally want to achieve. Ideally, you want an evaporator temperature that's quite low. And I remember being surprised last time we did this, you talked about how low the evaporator temps you guys aim for in air conditioning because you're focused on dehumidification. And dehumidification for most of us, even up where I am, is a huge part of air conditioning. So by increasing the average evaporator temperature by having too much superheat, we're really downgrading how well our system can operate. And that's a huge thing. You want just enough superheat so the system is stable and you're protecting the compressor, but no more how many watts you put in to how many BTUs of heat moved you get out. You want to have minimum superheat, the the lowest superheat you can possibly have. So for those of you who are listening to this, this is not what I'm telling you to do. I'm just telling you from a strictly theoretical energy efficiency standpoint, you want the lowest possible superheat. So you're using that entire evaporator coil. In fact, even a flooded evaporator coil is a great condition at the proper coil temperature to properly control humidity, whatever that may be, that varies. In some cases, you want a higher coil temperature to actually keep the humidity higher, like you mentioned in the case of a wine cooler. In air conditioning, where I am, we like to keep the coils cold because we want to remove as much moisture as we possibly can. And we want to have as low of subcool as we can have because the lower the liquid line temperature entering the metering device the less refrigerant is lost to flash gas initially. You want to have a subcool so that way you're, you don't have to drop temperature as far and you want to have as low a compression ratios as you can have. So the difference between your suction and your head pressure. Those are the factors that play into efficiency, but there's more at play here than just efficiency. Humidity is such a big deal, and I talk about humidity a lot, and I'm sure people probably get sick of hearing me talk about it, but you can save 20 bucks a month or 10 bucks a month on your electricity bill, but if you're not dehumidifying properly, you're really not getting value for those energy savings. Because if you have high humidity in your space, you're going to feel uncomfortable. And when people feel uncomfortable, as in uncomfortably warm, what's the first thing they do with their thermostat? Yeah, so you drop it another two degrees. Well, there goes all your savings and more out the window. You can say, well, yeah, you can use a programmable thermostat. Yeah, right. Do you not think that us or our spouses or whatever know how to override an an automatic thermostat? If we're uncomfortable, we're going to do something about it. We're not going to sit there and be uncomfortable all day long just to save 75 cents or a buck a day. You need to find that balance point and we can't do one and ignore the other and expect people to swallow it and be happy with it, right? So there's a lot that goes into this and this is where the intelligence behind a metering device can make a huge difference. The lowest liquid line temperature as possible is going to reduce the amount of flash gas that you produce because as you lower the energy of the liquid at high pressure, there's less of a difference between how much energy a liquid can hold, right, at high and low pressure. So you're going to produce less flash gas. And we could talk about this for 20 minutes and kill the rest of this podcast. But suffice to say, that's a good thing. Now we're going to talk about electronic expansion valve. So we talked about TXVs before. If you don't know how a TXV works, go back and listen to that podcast. But let's talk about the emergence of electronic expansion valves and why they even exist in the first place. What's the purpose? Why wasn't a TX valve good enough? The idea you have to understand is that a TX valve, and this is where having a picture is worth a thousand words, but a TX valve pretty much opens linearly. So linear is a straight line. It's angled up. If you have on the left of the upright axis, you've got percent opening. And on the bottom horizontal, you have superheat. So as your superheat increases, it drives the valve open. Near top capacity, let's say you've got 12 or 14 degrees of operating superheat. That's what you measure at the bottom of the outlet of the evaporator. Whereas when the valve is closed and is just about to start opening, you might have seven degrees. And this seven degrees is what we call static or factory superheat. That's the value you're gonna see on the side of the box. So between seven and 14, that valve is gonna go from being closed to open. 
that produces a straight line. For a given amount of superheat, you've got a certain amount of opening. That's great, except here's the issue. We have this value of the minimum superheat that evaporator requires. It's called minimum stable superheat. So let's take a minute here and explain about this because I really don't care if you remember minimum stable superheat, but I want you to understand that it's a minimum value that an evaporator has to have. As refrigerant goes through, liquid refrigerant goes through an evaporator and begins to boil, you've got more and more vapor being produced in that evaporator. And what happens is as the amount of liquid drops, it starts to form what we call a meniscus. That's the curve up the side of the evaporator wall. So you have this liquid being pushed up the wall by the boiling vapor. Eventually, when you get a small enough amount of liquid, it breaks off into droplets. And that liquid, because of surface tension, what happens when you drip water off of something? It forms a ball, right? Well, that ball now travels down the center of the pipe. It is much harder to heat that drop of refrigerant, and there can be quite a bit of liquid refrigerant here we're talking about, much harder to heat that in the middle of the pipe than it was when it was actually sticking to the side of the pipe. Basically, what we're saying is if an evaporator has a minimum stable superheat of five degrees or four degrees, you need to actually measure four or five degrees of superheat at the evaporator outlet in order to ensure that all these droplets have actually evaporated. And what ends up happening is if you try and operate a TX valve below this minimum stable superheat, because this liquid is in the center, but it's also moving around, it's going to slowly raise and lower the temperature of that pipe because you've got this mild mixing going on. It's rushing down the side. So the temperature's not stable. So you've literally got liquid surging up and down the bottom circuits of your evaporator. And so this is going to cause hunting in a TX valve. And we can show this on a refrigeration trainers by dialing down the superheat on the TX valve until it starts to hunt. That is below that minimum stable superheat setting for that evaporator. Now here's the thing. The minimum stable superheat value for an evaporator changes with capacity. It starts at low capacity and gets higher as the capacity increases. But once you get about mid-range, the change starts to drop off and the line becomes vertical. So what ends up happening is you have a curve, picture a curve for the minimum stable superheat. Now you take a straight line for a TX valve. What happens when you take a straight angled line and you put it against a curve? It touches in the middle, but then the curve moves away from the straight line at the top and moves away from the straight line at the bottom. So you have this huge gap at the bottom and at the top where that TX valve is going to give you far more superheat than what is actually required. So what we do is we aim the superheat at the TX valve so that it's always on the right side. It's always on the dry side or the stable side of that curve. That's why you can't just take your superheat setting on a TX valve and say, oh man, I'm gonna drive this down to two degrees. Well, guess what? You've moved that straight line inside the curve so that the middle 75 or 60% range of that evaporator, where in air conditioning anyways, you spend 90% of your time operating, it's going to be unstable. So it's not just a matter of reducing superheat on a TX valve. There is a minimum superheat you need with a TX valve in order for that system to operate. But the thing is, it's not fixed, that minimum stable superheat. It actually changes with evaporator capacity and, of course, evaporator design. So there's the big difference. And it all has to do with the velocity of the gas and the liquid change in the evaporator and these droplets becoming suspended. Guess what an EEV does? Depending on the design, with a Danfoss, for example, this is what I work with, EEV, it has built-in algorithms that search the superheat setting on that evaporator outlet. And when it detects a little bit of instability, it just bumps the superheat up a little bit until it becomes stable. So it's always pushing that edge and it will literally track that minimum stable superheat curve from high load to low load and always stay just to the right of it, as small as possible. You don't have to have any particular algorithms for an evaporator. It's just always tracking the superheat. So you put your refrigerant in there, what type of refrigerant you have, and the control does the rest. This is simplified. There are many different superheat regimes that are regimens that you can put in there. You can have it so it's a fixed superheat. You can have it so that it tracks more, gives you more superheat at certain points. But think about what this does. If I have an evaporator being fed by a TXV, and let's say it gets very humid in my space. Well, humidity is a load, and that's gonna drive up my evaporator superheat. So what's the TX valve gonna do 
Brian in response to that increased superheat. What's the only way that fixed speed compressor can pump that extra refrigerant the TX valve's putting in there? It doesn't change anything. The single stage compressor is just literally tied to the mass of the refrigerant entering it, right? As the TX valve opens up, the evaporator pressure starts to go up. But more importantly, the superheat setting or the superheat with the TX valve also increases. And as we know, under high load, as I said before, you've got far more superheat than what you actually need with a TX valve. If you have a lot more superheat with a TX valve, combined with a higher pressure in your evaporator and higher saturation temperature, you end up with a much higher average evaporator temperature. And what does that average, high of average evaporator temperature do to your dehumidification? It decreases it. So just at the time when you need more dehumidification, you're being penalized with it. This opens up two avenues. I've just basically foreshadowed what our next podcast can be, and that's variable speed compressors and variable speed airflow. By reducing the amount of superheat at high load, the EEV lowers the average evaporator temperature and will give you better dehumidification under high load when you most need it. But overall, it lowers your average evaporator temperature. If I lower my average evaporator temperature, this allows me, if dehumidification isn't a big deal, like in refrigeration, it allows me to increase my saturation temperature, my saturation pressure in my evaporator. So by increasing the saturation temperature by two or three or four degrees, this lowers my compression ratio. And if I lower my compression ratio, that saves me energy. Okay, I get less flash gas, I get more heat absorption in my evaporator, there's less energy being spent on compression. So overall, my efficiency increases. Now I mentioned food retail to you. Food retail, because they spend so much money on refrigeration and their margins are so low, they eat this stuff up. So you ask me why EEVs are replacing TXVs and where that benefit is, that's where the rubber hits the road right there. It allows them to optimize their systems to use less energy by increasing their evaporator pressure slightly and still getting the correct refrigeration. That's where those savings come from. The automatic superheat correction and optimization allows you to operate your evaporator slightly warmer and save a lot on energy and money. The guys with the highest energy costs are going to jump on board first, and that's exactly what we've seen over the last 10 or 15 years. When you look at air conditioning, there's an opportunity now to better adapt your evaporator, get better humidity control. You don't have to worry about people setting TX valves or a fixed superheat TX valve that's set at the factory, let's optimize for a specific point. These electronic expansion valves will figure out the superheat for you and do it automatically. It's one of these things where we've taken an issue where people don't like to work with superheat because they're not comfortable. It's hard to understand if you have the right value or not, and you have the electronics doing that for you. Whether you like that or not, that's kind of where the market's going at this point. So I'm here with James Bowman from Rector Seal, and real quick, I wanted to talk about the safety switch line of condensate switches, and I actually just got a safety switch that has a clear body on it. So is that product going to be hitting the market anytime soon, James? Uh, it's available now. We wanted to get it out to you first, just to get your input and see what you thought. So what do you think? I approve. Let me reach over here and grab it real quick. Are you going to show it to everybody? Yeah, you, you can look right. I'll tap it against the mic so everybody can hear it. Yeah, there it is. That's a safety switch. This is a model SS1, which is a model that we use a lot of in my business. We use SS1s, SS2s, and SS3s in our business. And I like it because with the clear body, you don't have to go messing with the top to see if it's got anything in it. And also, if you have an instance where you've got a homeowner and they're wondering if maybe it's the condensate switch, you can tell them to take a look at it without having them mess with wires and all that kind of thing because, you know, it's never a good idea to have a homeowner start yanking on things. So I think it's a really nice design. And uh, with it being you know, still PVC, which is pretty cool, it says Schedule 40 right on it. So I've never seen clear PVC like that before. It's kind of amazing that some of the things that we can do with plastics, but yeah, you can make Schedule 40 clear PVC. What I like about the safety switches is, is we've got a safety switch to cover a lot of areas. We've got the inline, the SS1, that can be used inline or as a secondary. We use the SS2 that is a secondary. The SS3 goes into a sheet metal pan. Those are our mechanical. Well, we also have an SS2 AP plenum rated. We also have an SS3 plenum rated. 
So if you've got a closet unit that they're requiring plenum rating because the switches are in the Airstream, we've got those. We have our SS700 is a hockey puck type switch. The hockey puck uh, you can set down in a return and on a floor in a pan, electronic. We've got the SS500, which is a plenum rated design for downflow rooftop package units. Then we have the SS16E, which is a mini split kind of state switch, which, yes, is a code requirement. Not enforced everywhere, but it is a code requirement. And what's the beauty of our electronic safety switch is that they have diagnostic LEDs. So, of course, green, no drain problem. Red, drain problem. The third light, yellow, indicates that it's had a drain problem sometime in the last four days. So you got a slow drain, it shuts the unit off, red light comes on, the water slowly drains down, the probes get dry up, the red light goes off, the green light comes on along with the yellow light. So now when you show up, oh, it's had a drain problem sometime in the last four days. Let me check for a slow drain. We also have an SS-103. The 103 is a combination, has two different sensors and three different combinations. So it has the SS-1 inline body, the SS-3 metal pan clip, and a screw-in adapter for the secondary port of your primary pan. So you can use two sensors with that are three different combinations as well. Very popular, number one selling line of switches in the country, and very, very popular and reliable switches. Another thing a lot of people don't know is that we test all of our mechanical and most of our electronic switches before they go into finished goods, before they ship, because that's what we want. We want you to have a reliable switch. That is the safety switch line of products from Rector Seal, probably the broadest line on the market. So look for safety switch products at your local supply house. Let me balance a few things here. So especially in supermarket applications or in refrigeration applications, it's a good thing because lower superheats and lower compression ratios are a huge factor in compressor longevity. So you increase the cooling effect to the compressor because you have a lower superheat, and you also simultaneously increase the compression ratio, which is also good on a compressor because that's something you're fighting off in refrigeration because the compression ratios are so much higher. Is that a fair statement? Absolutely. And now that you mentioned that, I missed that point. Yeah, on low temp refrigeration, your biggest enemy isn't high load because then you have lots of mass flow coming back to your compressor to cool it. Your enemy is when you're running low load with even lower evaporator pressures, low mass flow coming back to your compressors. How do you cool them? How do you get rid of that winding heat? Well, you put head coolers on, you put oil coolers on, you do all kinds of stuff. The compressors look like a drone, like they're going to fly off and start filming people. By any little help you can get there by reducing your superheat, by increasing or decreasing that compression ratio a little bit, that all goes a long ways to increasing compressor longevity. So again, good point. It's not just a focus on the evaporator and the meter device. There's also the downstream benefits as well. And so the pitch for the residential market is more that by controlling your superheat more accurately. And so really, if you think of a fixed metering device where you have essentially no control over superheat, and then you go one step down and you have a TX valve, a TEV that has decent control of superheat, but it has a range in which it starts to get outside of that zone and the superheat is set too high. And then you go to an electronic expansion valve that not only controls it very accurately, because first of all, it's just a more precision device, but second of all, because it actually is using algorithms to do it and to actually adapt to the operation of that system, you are controlling superheat in essentially the optimum possible way. That seems to be sort of the purpose of it is you're really managing that superheat in the optimum possible way to feed that coil with as much refrigerant as you possibly can while still ensuring that you don't have hunting or flood back. Let's just spend a minute down the road talking about this. There's a couple different types of electronic expansion valves, but on the other side, to the listeners out there, floating head pressure control, what it essentially does is it allows your head pressure to drop at night and during periods of lower ambient conditions so that it drops to the point where you just have enough pressure difference to feed your metering devices properly. Because you're dropping your head pressure, this allows you to lower your compression ratios during favorable time. It's kind of like the economizer side for the air, really is what it is. And it allows you to save energy. Historically, what guys have done, you can achieve the same effect by putting an oversized TX valve in 
And this allows you to drop your condensing pressures a little bit more, where if you had a normally sized TX valve, when that condensing pressure dropped, you wouldn't have enough feed through it. By oversizing your TX valve, believe it or not, it allows you to operate in this range of lower condensing temperatures. Oversizing the valve works, but there's also the downside to it. You got to make sure everything in that system is working exactly as it's supposed to do, because if the system hunts or it overfeeds or whatever, it's only going to do that much worse if the TX valve is oversized. With an electronic expansion valve, you can oversize or you can size that electronic expansion valve based on the lowest pressure difference that you can expect or that you want. You can let your condensing temperature drop to say 80 degrees outside or 75 degrees outside and the electronic expansion valve is sized so that it will just open up more while still maintaining the minimum possible superheat because it is only looking to maintain that minimum possible superheat and as long as the valve has enough capacity, it will open and close, throttle open and close happily all day long maintaining that minimum stable superheat. So this allows you to put variable speed fans on your condensers. It allows you to drop the condensing temperatures substantially, saving lots of energy. And supermarkets once again led the way on this because it is what we call low hanging fruit, where you have one technology enabling another technology or another opportunity to be pursued. So the capability of the electronic expansion valve to fine tune superheat regardless of your load and other extraneous conditions allows you to go into areas that you would not go into. So as you mentioned, fixed orifice is the opposite of that, right? You got a cool rainy day in air conditioning and you most need dehumidification. You don't have enough outdoor pressure to feed that piston. So your evaporator superheat goes through the roof under high wet bulb conditions. Just look at a piston charging chart and you'll see what I mean. Look at a 68 degree or 66 degree indoor wet bulb. Look at a 75 degree outdoor dry bulb and you've got like 20 degrees of superheat or 24 degrees of superheat on your evaporator. That drives your average evaporator temperature way up. So by doing one step and going to a TX valve, it can really help in that situation. In fact, it will probably give you the biggest bang for the buck, to be honest with you, and I mentioned this last time. Going to an EV will give you even more of an incremental benefit, but I have to admit, and at least in this situation, the TXV is probably gonna give you your biggest bang for the buck. The EV will certainly be a benefit, but again, just going to a adaptive control like a TX valve will give you a lot of improvement there. Getting back to floating head pressure, you can see what I mean where having something suddenly becomes available makes something else also available, as in good floating head pressure control. To kind of summarize this portion of it, the more variability that you have both in condensing temperature and in evaporator load, the more valuable a electronic expansion valve becomes. Because really what we're chasing, and we kind of already mentioned these few things, we're chasing target evaporator temperature. We talk about that a lot. You have a particular target evaporator temperature that you're trying to hit in almost every application for a particular purpose. Colder evaporator coil means more humidity removal. Warmer evaporator coil means less humidity removal. Depending on the application, it's going to dictate that in refrigeration, air conditioning, whatever the case may be. We're also chasing low compression ratios. And in refrigeration especially, they're really chasing that, which is the reason for the floating head pressure controls. Because back in the day, and we've all seen this in air conditioning and a lot of different applications, you have fan cycling switches. An old school head pressure control, you just cycle a condenser fan, one of the condenser fans out of many on a large RTU or on a bank of condensers on refrigeration, and that keeps the head pressure at a set target. But what they realized is, well, you're artificially driving up this, this head pressure, and it's not necessary to always drive it up that much. And what's resulting is you have, in some cases, astronomical compression ratios, which is killing your compressors. And on one hand, it's they're not being properly cooled. And on the other hand, it's just driving down your efficiency unnecessarily. So there's all these factors. And the more money that you're spending on these things, the more that becomes a consideration. Whereas on the residential side, we're finding that we're less concerned. We are concerned about efficiency, but it's kind of diminishing returns at this point. We're more concerned now about dehumidification. And when Jamie says average evaporator temperature, I just want to hit on this real quick because a lot of you, and I've actually pushed for this, I've been telling guys, let's start calling what we previously would call suction saturation. Let's start calling that evaporator temperature because there's a lot of areas that they do that. And so the evaporating temperature, the boiling temperature of the refrigerant in that coil 
is going to be your suction saturation or your evaporator temperature until you hit the superheat range. And the more superheat you have, the more of that coil is dedicated to superheat and the less of that coil is dedicated to the boiling of refrigerant, which is why the average evaporator temperature is now less efficient. So you have a higher average evaporator temperature. So when you say it has a higher average evaporator temperature, we're not saying that the the suction saturation changes. What we're saying is, is that because you have extra superheat, the coil is warmer at the end of the coil. And so when you average that all out, you overall have a warmer coil. Well, let's take it to the extreme. You got an evaporator temperature, right, of 45 degrees. You're aiming for 42 degrees, 40 degrees, depending on where you are for air conditioning. You get a blocked piston or metering device. Your evaporator temperature drops down to 20 degrees. You've got frost on your inlet, but you've got like 3,000 degrees of superheat at the outlet of the evaporator, right? I can guarantee you, I'd put 20 bucks down, that your average evaporator temperature with a 20 degree saturated suction and no refrigerant flow is going to be a heck of a lot higher than your average temperature is when it's properly feeding refrigerant and your saturation temperature is 45 or 40 degrees. Otherwise, if it wasn't, you'd continue to cool and you'd continue to dehumidify, right? And that's not the case. It's how much refrigerant you have flowing through it, how much heat removal you can do that largely determines that average evaporator temperature. There's really two types of electronic expansion valves. There's what's called a pulse width. That is like a solenoid valve that's either open or closed, or there's a stepper motor. And a stepper motor is kind of like a motor doing the same thing as you turning off a faucet, right? Opening and closing it. You're driving a spool down or the spindle down and open. The stepper motor one, it pulses in the sense of it maybe have a couple of hundred steps to be fully open and a couple of hundred steps to be fully closed. And you got a little motor that turns one way or the other depending on the signal. So the motor will drive the valve open or closed depending on the superheat. Whereas a pulse width valve, in our case, in Dan Foss's case, it is either open or closed. You run over a six second period of time. So if your load is 50% of the valve's capacity, it's gonna be open three seconds out of six. If you're in pull down mode, it might momentarily or short period of time be open five and a half or six seconds out of six. And then as your load drops off, the amount of time it's open during that period of time drops off. There's benefits and there's drawbacks to both. The benefit of the pulse width is, hey, you've got a built-in normally closed solenoid valve. When it goes into pump down mode, it acts as a solenoid valve for you and eliminates that issue. Some people don't like the pulsations that a pulse width valve does. But again, the industry in Danfoss is working on a pulse width valve that eliminates that by having soft opening and closing. So there's always an opportunity to improve on something. A stepper motor design has the ability to pick a spot inside where it will open and close and modulate. It's a lot quieter benefits to that. The other benefit to pulse width is when the valve is open, your refrigerant velocity is high and you flush the oil out and move it along. Again, it all depends. You can argue both technologies. Both of them accomplish the same thing and that is maintain that minimum stable superheat. Not to blow Danfoss's horn, but we actually have that patent on minimum stable superheat control. Everybody else has to do a fixed superheat. If you go to anybody else's valve, you got to pick the superheat you want to maintain, and then it maintains a straight vertical line for superheat. You can do that with our valves as well. A lot of people opt for this minimum stable superheat design. You can go through and pick your control regimen that you want to follow, but the default one in this aftermarket kit is going to be minimum stable superheat. And it's probably going to be a stepper motor valve at this time, but things do change, so stay tuned. It is interesting, just as a general observation, is that when you go from analog to digital, everything in digital is some form of like on and off, some form of it. Even the stepper motor, it isn't really on and off, but it's still on and off of different steps. Like it's, yeah, it's an analog signal between voltage and polarity, right? So it's driving it back and forth. But when you think of like, and this is true of so many different things, digital photography versus analog photography, you have pixels in digital photography where it breaks it down to these ultimately yes, no, one, zero, true, false type of uh, Boolean equation type of thing. And in analog, you do, you just have this kind of more smooth thing, which is a factor when you think about these technologies. We're so used to everything being new as digital. Look at the variable speed fan. What's the output on your controller? It's analog, analog to a variable speed motor got a voltage ramp, you got a frequency ramp. That's the kind of output you're looking at. Digital is definitely on off, open and closed. And a solenoid valve is definitely a digital control. 
But even when you look at variable frequency drives, you look at PWM and a variable frequency drive, it's the same sort of challenges that you face where you're attempting to take a pulse with a signal and attempting to mimic a natural analog frequency, which is interesting. It's the same kind of thing. If you can imagine what this valve is doing, it's doing essentially what a variable frequency drive is doing in the case of powers. Everybody has their preferred way of doing it. And both technologies are probably going to be around for a long time. And definitely depend on who you talk to, you're going to find one person from your preference and over one over the other. And there is some benefits to some compared to the other. But again, it all depends on the application, what you prefer, your piping runs, how long are they, how big of an issue is oil return, things like that. Again, there's solutions on both sides to these, but it all depends on what you prefer. We're definitely looking forward to getting more of the electronic expansion valves out there only because it will eliminate a lot of the issues of having to sit down and fine tune superheat. So if you look at the time a tech spends fine tuning superheat, especially on certain evaporator designs, trying to find something that is as low as possible, but at the same time is stable, the electronic expansion valves will do all that work for you. From a time saving standpoint, labor's not cheap these days. There is a benefit to that too as well. That and also being able to tie back to tracking. You have communication to another module or to a data log. And if something goes wrong, you can go back and look three or four days and say, oh yeah, this is where we started to have issues right here. What happened? What was going on during that period of time? Was there a voltage spike? Was there my defrost heaters go out or something like that? And you can actually take that information and follow it back. So that communication is big. But I think we've kind of covered this today. I mean, do you have anything else you want to kind of jump on before we go? No, that was a good final point, though, is the data sets that you get out of an electronic expansion valve are superior because you can actually look at what percentage open is it. And, and I work a lot on the Carrier Infinity products, the Infinity Touch Control, and it'll actually give you that data. You can actually look and see what position is your electronic expansion valve in heat mode. And that's something that you'll notice. A lot of like the Carrier Green Speeds or the Carrier VNA8 five-speed rotary systems, they're high-efficiency heat pumps. If you have a heat pump in heat mode, you have very similar varying load conditions. And so it's an interesting kind of core corollary to make here is that, you know, we talk about hot pull down, we talk about all these different conditions, low load, high load. Well, in a heat pump, you've got much wider load conditions than you have in an air conditioning system. What would you say that the mix is, if you have variable speed, you know, variable speed air, variable speed compressors, is it almost entirely electronic expansion valves now on the AC heat pump side? This is a perfect example. So what I have on my house is a four-ton carrier VNA8, which is a five-speed rotary, and I love the system. And it's a electronic expansion valve for the heat mode, so outside, but inside, it's a regular TXV. It, would it be superior to have an electronic expansion valve? Yeah, I mean, there are manufacturers who do that. Train has been using electronic expansion valves. But the variation in operating conditions aren't as great in cooling mode as there are in heating mode. It doesn't have quite the returns on it. No, you're absolutely correct. And I remember I mentioned that with it going from a piston to a TX valve is going to be your biggest bang for the buck there. At the same time, I also know from uh, talking to contractors, what they don't like about TX valves is we talked about earlier in the TX valve thing. They want to put a piston there because it's simple. They understand what it's going to do. There's no hidden surprises. At first glance, you'd think an EEV would be even worse. But in many ways, I hate to use the word takes care of that stuff for you. And people might question it. But really, the fact that it looks after the optimal superheat for you, it can probably give you peace of mind that way. It all depends on how much you trust technology and how much you jump into the technology realm. But really, there is an opportunity there to take some workload off of you if you're dealing with TX valves and you're not like adjusting them and you're not comfortable with the settings or knowing the correct setting. This goes a long ways to help with that. And that's anybody's EV, to be honest with you. Something to think about. And the example I would give there is when programmable thermostats first came out. The first, I remember the Chronotherm series from Honeywell of programmable thermostats. Those things were beasts to deal with. I mean, they were such a pain in the butter. I remember that some of the first Honeywell residential zone damper panels that came out. I'm trying to remember what the name of the one that I used to work on all the time was. It's slipping my mind. But they were just so complicated, and they had all these relays on there that would fail and all these issues. Well, now I work on a programmable thermostat recently, the one in my house, for example, or I work on a modern Honeywell uh, damper panel or most of the commercially available residential damper panels now, they have so much logic in them that they don't even let you wire them wrong. It's like it'll tell you if something's wired wrong. It's hilarious. And so in, some, in one sense, we can say, well, there's this curve where I think this is an example of what we're talking about here. You go from a piston to a TXV and you say, well, the TXV is more of a pain. I think you'll find if you go to electronic expansion valves, in a lot of ways, they're going to actually be less frustrating to deal with because of some of the data is improved and some of the algorithmic control 
is improved to the point that it takes away a lot of that heartache that you may get with a TXV, let alone you don't have to deal with the bulbs snapping off on you all the time. To me, that's the single biggest service advantage is that you don't have to deal with that delicate bulb. I'm agreed, man. That's a big thing. And as I told you last time, I can sympathize with people when it comes to TX valves. They showed up on equipment. A lot of times they're not adjustable. As long as everything's working okay, it's easy. But when something goes wrong, where do you start? And that's kind of where a lot of our training and stuff like that focused on after the fact and built upon so that people were more comfortable. But again, you have to kind of take that system wide view and eliminate all other possible things before you actually get down to that TX valve. But anyways, well, hey, thanks again. I appreciate you having me on here. And I hope we didn't drift off topic too much. I apologize if I did. But I'd like to be able to come back on sometime and let's talk about variable speed because variable speed is such a big part of the market now. And it's kind of like when, you know, analog brakes first came out. You only saw them on really expensive cars that you could never afford. And now you can buy a Kia Rio or something like that, right? And it comes with anti-lock brakes, right? So I'm hoping variable speed will eventually make its way into enough of a mainstream. There's definitely a lot of questions about it there's a lot of awareness and I think there's also a fair bit of trepidation out there. So if we can talk about it up the future, I would really appreciate it. Oh yeah, that sounds great to me. I don't think we got too far off base. I think we covered the topic the way it needed to be covered for technicians to get their mind around it. So thank you for all you do, Jamie. As you know, I'm a big fan of what you do in your trainings. Keep doing what you're doing and I'll be happy to have you on again soon. Awesome. Thank you. Appreciate the effort. Take care. Thanks for listening to the HVAC School podcast. Thanks for visiting our website, which is HVACRschool.com. Thanks for going to bluecollarroots.com and listening to the other podcasts in the network. We're coming into the fall here, and in my business down here in Central Florida, that means we start to slow down, and we're going to start shifting topics here on HVAC School. We're looking forward to talking about gas furnaces and combustion analysis, hydronics. We have a really, really good episode coming up with Dan Hollihan, the author of Pumping Away and Classic Hydronics and many, many other great books and articles and his site, heatinghelp.com. So we've got that coming up for those of you who are interested in that. I want to take a quick second and just thank Carrier. Carrier's been with me since I started my business back in 2005, and, and really my relationship with Carrier predates that. The main reason why I wanted to sell Carrier when I started my own business is that I had such a good relationship with their training staff. There's a guy by the name of Ray Johnson, and I used to go to his classes, and Ray was just a no-nonsense, blue-collar guy, and he would just tell it like it was, and really smart, taught me a lot about air conditioning. And I like that about carriers that, yeah, they're a big corporation. Sure, they're a big business, but they seem to always care about their research development and technical side of their products. They advertise. Everybody advertises. I mean, heck, this is sort of an advertisement, I guess. But it's an advertisement that comes from a caring for the core functionality of the product. And I've always appreciated that about Carrier. Everybody has bumps along the road. Everybody has things that, every business has things that don't go perfectly from time to time. But I'm still glad that I'm a Carrier dealer. I'm proud to be a Carrier dealer. We're doing really well selling Carrier equipment this year. And and I'm really proud of how they handled the green speed recall. You know, they actually voluntarily came out and said, hey, look, nothing's happened yet, but we've noticed some things. So let's recall these boards and replace them. And I thought that was pretty good. It was a seamless process. They treated me well. Uh, they always have treated me well, even when I was a nobody. Even when I, th- I think my first year in business, I sold something like, I don't know, $50,000 worth of units, you know, which is uh, well below what you should sell in order to deal carrier equipment. But they worked with me, and, and I'm thankful to them for that. And I'm thankful that they're partnering with HVAC School to, once again, just invest in training of technicians. The same thing that brought me to carrier in the first place and made me choose to use them is the same reason why they're partnering with us on HVAC School, and I I certainly appreciate it. And I just want to remind you that HVAC School is really about kind of core training for the industry. It's technical training for people who put their hands on the equipment. But we also have some other podcasts like HVAC Shop Talk, where they talk more about industry trends. They do some training over there as well, but it's a little different flavor. We also have Building HVAC Science, which is a much more in-depth look at the science, the building side, the structure, the testing and diagnosis of a structure, measuring airflow, those sorts of things. We have a lot of different podcasts that you can listen to. Actually, another podcast that's unrelated to air conditioning at all that I just released today is called Rather Be Fishing with Mike Locus, and that's all about fishing. And Mike is actually an employee of mine, but he's also a pro fisherman, ex-pro fisherman. I shouldn't say ex, he's still technically a pro, I guess. And he's also been a guide, and he really likes fishing and thinking about fishing when he should be working for me. But I would rather 
have him with me than again me, so I helped him create a podcast called Rather Be Fishing with Mike Clocus. And if you're a fisherman, I think you really like that. And that's what Blue Collar Roots is. It's not just trades podcasts. It's everything that people who are hardworking Americans and also maybe some of you across the pond. I know we have a lot of Australians and people from Canada who listen as well, but who enjoy kind of that blue collar life. So you enjoy fishing, maybe you enjoy hunting, you like working with your hands, you like working on your car, or those sorts of things. Blue Collar Roots is a great resource for all of those different things. So thanks for listening. Check out bluecollarroots.com if you are willing to do that. That would be great. As winter approaches, or you know, you may already be in it where you are in Florida. We don't have much of a winter, but uh, you may wonder how you can find Will Smith in the snow. Well, the answer is you just look for the Fresh Prince. <laughs> I'll see you next time on HVAC School. Thanks for listening to the HVAC School podcast. You can find more great HVACR education material and subscribe to our short daily tech tips by going to HVACRschool.com. If you enjoy the podcast, would you mind hopping on iTunes or the podcast app and leave us a review? We would really appreciate it. See you next week on the HVAC School Podcast.